In today's episode of the Test Automation Experience, we're meeting with the amazing and super knowledgeable, the queen of Agile, Lisa Crispin. We're talking about a bunch of topics related to Agile testing, Agile testing best practices, testing in DevOps, using continuous integration, continuous delivery, ensemble testing, and a bunch of wonderful resources to learn how to do Agile testing better. So wait no more, and let's go and learn how we can deliver high quality software faster with Agile testing. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today on the Test Automation Experience. Today we are so lucky to have a wonderful testing leader Lisa Crispin. If you're unfamiliar with her, I'll give you all a little bit of a background. She probably doesn't need one, but I'll just quickly read it anyway. Lisa Crispin is the co-author with Janet Gregory of Agile Testing Condensed, a basic introduction, more agile testing learning journeys for the whole team, Agile Testing, a practical guide for testers and agile teams, the Live Lessons Agile Testing Essentials video course, Lisa was voted by her peers as the most influential agile testing professional person at Agile Testing Days in 2012. So basically, Lisa and Janet Gregory are the queens of agile testing. Did I miss anything, Lisa? I think that sums it up pretty well. Yeah, well, the, we spoke at a conference in Uruguay testing, testing UI a couple of years ago, and they called us the mothers of Las Mujeres de Agile Testing, which I, we, we were thought that was hilarious. We even made t-shirts. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Interestingly enough, you know, we've used this Agile Testing, I don't know, brand, if you will, for so many years. But people, the, you know, as you know, I'm sure the word Agile, what does it mean anymore? You know, uh, humans need labels, but then they become interpreted in many different ways. And uh, in 2021, Janet came up. Well, I helped, but Janet came up with this, her new holistic testing model. And we really think holistic testing describes what we do a lot better because it, it, it denotes it's something the whole team has to be involved with, the whole, even the whole organization, not just testers, and that it's all around that whole software development DevOps loop that we're doing testing activities and trying to build quality in. So. Holistic testing is is what we prefer, but we you know we can't go back and rename our books or our website or anything or our company. We have the Agile Testing Fellowship together. We have two two training courses, Agile Testing or Holistic Testing Strategies for Agile Teams, which is our, our basic live course to help teams learn how to succeed with testing with the frequent delivery of, of agile and then we have a new course coming out holistic testing for continuous delivery we're still putting the finishing touches on that we've done one course to train some of our trainers on it we're really excited about it just to give people to help people understand you know how can we work together build a healthy quality devops culture and work towards successful continuous delivery building in all those testing activities so we're trying to cover that whole left and right side of that devops that that's super cool man you've touched on so many topics and questions that popped up in my head i guess maybe we can kind of take it from a beginner's perspective and maybe introduce us like what is agile or i guess maybe better referred to as holistic testing why is it important and how can we do it well well i always liked Elizabeth Henderson's definition of agile. She, she called it her agile asset test and I'll have to paraphrase, but it's delivering value to customers frequently. It's a small increments of value to customers frequently at a sustainable pace. And that sustainable pace is what captures all the good practices that have come along with extreme programming. And, you know, they're not new practices. You know, we were doing these practices many years ago too, but making more people more aware of good practices like continuous integration, test-driven development, accepted test-driven development, you know, pairing, refactoring, all those things. If you don't, and test automation, obviously is a huge part of that. And so if you don't do those things, you cannot continue to deliver small chunks of value confidently at a sustainable pace. And that's, that's so key. So people here agile, and they're like, oh, we're going to go faster. We're going to go faster. No, probably at first you're going to go a lot slower because you got a lot you have to learn. And then they hear the word continuous delivery. And, it, and I mean, I have encountered, sadly, 
so many teams where, okay, we're going to, we're going to deliver every week or twice a week or every day. You testers better hurry up. <laughs> that doesn't work. And so helping people understand, you know, we've always, Janet and I have for 20, more than 20 years now have, have embraced the extreme programming approach and scrum approach of it's a whole team thing. We can't, test quality in. We knew that many years ago, but the whole team has to work together to build quality and build that confidence to keep putting changes in production for our customers. But now we, we, now that we have DevOps, that's become more visible. Now that we have infrastructure as code, now that we have all these extra technology that helps us learn so much from production, what can we learn from our customers? What problems are they having? And, and on the right side of that DevOps loops and feedback on the left side, now we know they're testing all the way around that. And, and that's what the holistic idea is trying to capture. So it's, it's hard because even today, you know, back in the waterfall days, obviously people thought, well, the testers are going to do a testing phase sometime. <laughs> now the waterfall teams I was on did not take that attitude, but that was a typical attitude. But I'm really sad to see that's still the case. People that tell me they have agile teams and I talk to their testers that are embedded on the teams, they're still getting code thrown over the wall to them basically. So it's a long, change is hard. <laughs> Things always, obviously are changing and getting a lot better, but there's still a lot of people struggling. That's, 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 that's such a good point about I still like being a, a formerly a solution architect at SawStab. So it was a customer facing role I got to basically help teams implement automated testing, better automated testing practices, different sizes of teams. And I would still always see where they say, yeah, we do agile. And then you actually start probing and then you find out that what agile really means is maybe there's a two week or a month long sprint of the developers followed by a two week sprint of testing, you know, where they throw it over and then everyone moves it at their own different cadences. There is usually no CICD. And I find that to be more common with larger organizations, I guess, just because it is so much harder to change 100,000 people and the culture versus if you're a team of like 20, you're like, oh, this makes sense. Let's try it and quickly iterate, right? Have you, well, what has been your experience around that? I was really fortunate to start on smaller teams. And in fact, well, I was really fortunate even in before Agile came along, that I was on very, very healthy waterfall teams. So if we did waterfall in the sense that we only released every six months or a year, and we did have those phases, and everybody was involved in all the phases. So developers and testers and other people came to the analysis meetings and the requirements meetings, and we tested the requirements. You know, we went through and looked for inconsistencies and, and clarity and had conversations around, well, does this make sense? This contradicts this other thing. And then as the developers were coding, they were not doing test-driven development on the team I was on, but definitely incredibly good unit test coverage. And then we did, in that case, it was a database product. We didn't really have a service level or API level, but we did the UI level automation and testing. And it was very much a collaborative effort Yes, it was waterfall. And so I was used to working that way. I was used to collaborating with people. And my first extreme programming team, you know, we were a team of 10 people. That's ideal. We didn't have any idea what t the tester should do because at the time, <laughs> the extreme pro programming publications of the time were all about testing and quality, but they didn't mention testers. So I was like, oh, I wonder what we should do. And so we kind of figured that out together. And that, that's at the time I met Janet because she was having a similar struggle on her extreme programming team. And we found other, other testers in the community slowly other times like, yes, we do add value. And then, so I worked more for startups for the large portion of my career. In the last few years, I've worked for larger organizations, you know, companies with up to 40 feature teams. And working a lot more, sometimes in some cases, working more on the monitoring and observability side of things, as well as testing. And it's, I have seen, so I have understood the difficulties. Some teams are always going to do a lot better. Some teams are really going to struggle. And the leadership of the company is so important of giving people the time to learn, nurturing that learning culture, helping everybody 
have a common goal that they're working towards. That's so important. And, and unfortunately, we don't always get that good leadership. But but collaborating with Janet over the years has been really helpful because Janet has helped huge companies through agile transformations. And so she's really seen the other side of the coin of how do you do this on a very large scale? And it is a quite a different experience. So I've, I've been lucky to learn from her and a whole bunch of other people in our community. So yeah, it's interesting. Wow. Very cool. And you kind of got me thinking, what do you think it is that has some teams that maybe excel at doing agile better versus not? Is it, you, you touch on leadership a little bit. Is that the primary cause or there are other causes of that? My experience is that teams really de- do need to become self-organizing autonomous teams. That's something you have to learn. It's really hard for people who've never worked in that environment to learn how to do that. So you need a really good coach, a really, really, you, first of all, you need company executives who understand we need to give them time. They're not going to be cranking features out. They're learning practices like test-driven development, continuous integration, you know, all the refactoring, all these things. We'll get features. We're not going to, we're not going to automatically go faster because we're agile. We're making an investment in quality, which will pay off in the long run. And, and then having a coach or a manager who can help them learn how to be self-organizing. And my experience has been what we had to learn was we had to use retrospectives and figure out what's the biggest problem in our way. Oh, well, first of all, we had a discussion of what level of quality do we want? People talk about quality, mom, apple pie and quality. It's all good. How do you get there? And so my teams that succeeded and became high performing teams started with a discussion. What level of quality do we want? Well, we want to write code that we're so proud of that we take it home and show mom and put it on the refrigerator. What does that mean? How do we get there? Hmm. Well, it looks like the extreme programming practices are one way to get there. So we'll embrace those. Where do we start? Hmm. Continuous integration. Let's do that first. Okay. That's going well. Test driven development. How do we do that? Our manager gets training for us. Our manager gives us time to learn it. Our manager helps us with pair programming. Our manager maybe hires somebody senior who already knows and has done these practices. So that's where the leadership comes in and that the, the leaders of the company, the business side can trust you, trust your team that you're going to get there baby step by baby step. And at the same time, learning the business domain, that's very important too, because we need to be able to help the business understand, you know, what features do they want next? What makes sense from a financial perspective? Uh, what's going to give the most value for the customers and not cost too much to develop? All those things have to come together and it just can't happen overnight. So that's why I say, I think the leadership and the support they give to their teams, that learning culture, psychological safety, you know, Joshua Karievsky's Modern Agile, one of his prerequisites is psychological safety. And that is so true too. We have to feel safe to ask questions. We have to feel safe to bring up problems. We had to feel safe to try things. And maybe then, you know, we are experimenting to improve. Our experiments aren't all going to work. If we don't try experiments, we won't improve. So all those things kind of have to come together. Yeah, that totally makes sense. As you kind of were talking about that, it connected me to a lot of companies that I've worked with. One was really great where it had a lot of the qualities that you mentioned, but like psychological safety, ability to learn, ability to improve, support for managers and so on. And there, actually, that's still like the ideal agile environment that I still always try to achieve whenever working with other teams or, you know, trying to see how teams are, trying to see how teams can do better. But then many other organizations that I've worked with, they really, the way agile worked there was they say, okay, we're doing agile. This is what it means. Go do Mm -hmm. it. And that's it. And that really kind of was as far as it went. Maybe they put some like limits on like, okay, our sprints are now four weeks and we're going to do standups every day and our standups will be 30 minutes long and everyone from every team will present, you know, and it was, it's just super funny how everybody takes it and tweaks it to their own needs and then just applies a label. Well, and you know, because you've been on one of those high performing teams and Janet and I talk about this a lot. If you've never experienced the unicorn magic of a team that's getting that support, 
and being able to make those kind of improvements and learning, you can't imagine what it's like. So when I try to tell people about this, they're like, well, that's never going to happen because they've never been in an environment where it could happen. Right. T tell us about that magic. Describe to a lot of us that have never experienced it. Well, uh, first of all, it's just the trust among team members that that freedom to suggest things or even, you know, we're thinking about what, how best do we implement this feature? We might have different ideas. We might We might have a pretty strong discussion about it, we know it's not a personal attack. And I, as a tester, can feel free to put out my views without somebody saying, you're just a tester, or this is too technical for you. You're not even invited to this discussion. That's the big difference. And I've actually been on teams where the tester came up, not me, but another tester came up with an amazing solution to a problem nobody else could figure out. But having that trust and also having the trust with the business that they know that we're always going to do our best and deliver their best. And they're going to listen to us when they come to us with a feature and we understand the business domain and say, well, you know, 80% of that feature, that's not too hard to implement. There's 20% of it. That's really going to be expensive. And we're not sure the customers really need that. Do you think you really need that? Cause that's going to be half the cost if we do it. And they are, always say, no, we don't need that. So but being able to help them pare down, people think agile teams go faster. A lot of times what they do is they help the business figure out a more thin slice, efficient way that's going to solve the customer problem without adding a lot of unnecessary fluff that nobody wants. And so just having that freedom, of course, you're not going to be happy all the time, but but knowing that you can bring problems up in retrospectives, knowing that, you know, a lot of times what happens in retrospectives on larger teams is the testers' pain points never get addressed because they're outnumbered. But having an environment where everybody cares about the testing, and so, oh, yeah, there is a problem. Let's all, as a team, experiment and see what we can do about that problem. So, yeah, that's that's what it is for me. What about, like, also just some... Um kind of more common attributes of quality and things that I think people are trying to achieve when they do Agile, like the, were your teams able to release faster with less bugs and yeah, those kind of things? Absolutely. I mean, the very, I guess that was the, the, the third, actually the, the second and third XP teams or second and third Agile teams I was on, both did pretty well in that respect. But the one I was on from 2003 to, I was there from 2003 to 2012. So I got to, you know, we started, when I joined that team, we had 17 showstopper bugs in the bug tracker. <laughs> That's how bad it was. And they hadn't had a new release out the door for nine months. And the owners of the company, the founders of the company were like, this isn't going well, and our whole business model depends on the software. So what do we do? They ask around. They heard about Agile, and they said, well, who's the best person in our area? This is Denver for Agile, and they were the, some, they were told, well, Mike Cohn. I don't know if you're familiar with Mike Cohn, but he's quite oh yeah, quite legendary in the in the Scrum world. Yeah. And so they went out and hired Mike Cohn. It wasn't easy. He, went, he, didn't, he didn't want a full-time job, but they finally convinced him. And he, then they listened to him. He said, we need to do this, 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 and this. And they're like, okay. You know, he said, give my team time. We need time. Okay. We need some more infrastructure. We need some money for more servers or whatever tools, whatever we need. Okay. Because so often executives hire people to, to know how to develop software. And then they try to tell them how to develop the software and don't listen to them. And so that, that was a big help. But we started off not even be able to build. You know, we couldn't even build an artifact to deploy. and you know, then pretty soon it's like, well, every once every two weeks we had a successful build. <laughs> Yay. And then we're Yay. like, oh, we have at least one green build every day. And then it just came to where failed builds were the exception because we're running unit tests locally. And, you know, and eventually we did, but it was before we knew the word continuous delivery because uh, Jed's Humble and Dave Farley's book hadn't come out yet. We didn't release every day because in the, in the business domain we were in, People didn't want changes that frequently, but we could, we had a deployable, releasable bill that we could have deployed anytime. And that took a few years. 
you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And yeah, it looked like we were going super fast because p part of the part of the reason was, like I say, we were paring down the requirements for each feature to what was really necessary. We spent time, we budgeted time. We were influenced by Tom and Mary Poppendick who visited us one time. They were happened to be in town for a conference or something. And we invited them over and they were staying at the hotel right next door. And they're like, you know, it's a really good idea to sit with the business people and understand their job better. And we're like, oh, that's an interesting idea. So we budgeted time, spent story points, sitting side by side with all the different people on the business side and understanding their requirements. And sometimes they didn't even know that they that we could solve a problem for them with software. Right? Wow. And so yeah. it just... that. That was a dream team, right? <laughs> because we were part of the business. We weren't some organization off to the side cranking out the software. We were part of the business. We were helping the whole business succeed. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And it's yeah, a lot of a lot of cultural and technical challenges to overcome, which talking to you made me realize I'm like, that's why it's so hard, because it takes a lot of commitment from everybody. Mm -hmm make it successful and you have to be patient i'm not patient <laughs> but it's like oh you know like automation we need automation oh my gosh we started out with no automation so i went to the business people and said what's what absolutely has to work when we some, release something new what what absolutely can we not break and they gave me a list of like 20 things in priority order and so i created test scripts for the manual test scripts for those and then every two weeks before we released, I divided those up among the whole team. Again, you need management support for that. The DBA, the scrum master, the product owner, everybody had their little section of acceptance tests to do. And guess what? That really motivated everybody to automate. <laughs> what can we do to make it easier idea. to automate? And then it was like, well, we, you know, we were working for Mike Cohn and that was when he came up with the test automation pyramid. It's like, well, the most value is in that unit level. We need that as a foundation. So let's learn test driven development, unit testing. And so I'm thinking, yeah, and meanwhile, ugh, these manual tests. So we found a UI level test tool that would suit our needs. And I automated smoke tests for those 20 things that were on our regression test list. Now we, now we kind of stopped the bleeding. We didn't have to spend time every sprint doing all the manual regression tests. So now, you know, once they were getting traction with unit level tests, which took a while, then I then I was like impatient. Like I want to test at that service level in the middle because there's a lot of value there. And I was like, oh, I have to be patient. I have to let them get a grip on this unit testing first. But finally, we were ready. I went to a developer and said, hey, we've agreed to use, you know, at the time we were using fitness, we've agreed to use this tool to do these service level tests. Would you? You're working on this story. Can we sit down together for an hour and see if we can write a fitness test for this story? And he's like, oh, okay. And so we sat down and wrote the test right away, found a bug. And so the next day I stand up, he's like, hey, Lisa and I did this fitness test and it was pretty easy and really valuable. We should do more of that. And, but I mean, this is a process that took months and months and months. And then even a couple of years in, we did a new architecture. We did this uh, strangler fig pattern where the legacy code was such a flipping mess that we just started doing all the new features in a new, you know, MVP layered architecture and had to build a bridge between those. And, and we thought the new stuff was so great. We're so proud of our code. And then a couple of years in, we're like, oh, that code's terrible. <laughs> and really that architecture is not very good. You know, so we had to keep improving on it. There's always going to be problems to solve. Yeah, for sure. I feel like that's always the issue with software is it's always evolving. And every time I look back at some stuff I did a few years ago, I'm like, oh, who did this? I can't believe I did this. Now <laughs> right. I'm like, so much, so much better and smarter, right? One point I was going to say, I don't know if you agree with me. I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of things that I've seen for like creating quality in organizations, the stick tends to work better than the carrot. Like, Another great, you gave one example of, you know, hey, give people manual tests and then it'll force them oh, to automate. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing I've seen is put pe everybody on the team in charge of monitoring production. Mm -hmm. And if it goes down, mm -hmm. you wake up in the middle of the night on the weekend and fix it. Now the team will start caring about quality and adding in fail safes and redundancy and automated tests and so on. And 
Um, I, I haven't seen like positive, like carrot examples of that working too much, unless they're super passionate about quality, like yourself and me. I, I think you're absolutely right. It's a really great point. People have to feel pain. Change is hard and people won't change if they don't feel the pain. And yeah. so in organizations where it's up to the testers to do the testing or even just to do the automation, the developers are never going to change their ways. They're going to always have those testers as safety nets. Then they're, they're being perhaps pressured to crank out code. It's your job. Crank out the code. Meet this deadline. They have no incentive to improve the testing. So yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. And I think that's one of the great things that that the DevOps culture brings us. And, and I wish I could think of his name off the top of my head. Somebody wrote a really good blog post a few years ago that doing a DevOps transformation rather than an agile transformation makes you agile. <laughs> this is the same thing, but that whole mentality of we build it, we run it, we own it. And we're feeling the pain and, directly the pain in production. I am so sad whenever I see a software organization, I think we're having a lot of production bugs and their way to fix that is we're going to have a team of developers that all they do is fix bugs. So the people who coded the bugs in never even know. They don't get any kind of feedback like that. And that's just going to lead to more problems. So yeah, you're absolutely right. They have to feel the pain. And it's like, if I don't want to get woken up at three in the morning, I'm going to really make sure this works. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, I'm going to build in really good observability so I can understand the problem and fix it really fast. Exactly. All, all great things. Lisa, you talked about this a little bit. Explain to us the difference between Agile and DevOps, or is there a difference? I don't think there is a difference to me. So when the word DevOps came up, I was puzzled because it's like, well, of course I'd always been on smaller teams and our operations, people were part of our team. And I was heavily, I was always heavily involved in operations. I was involved in configuring the CI. I was, I even did production releases for a long time until our auditor told us that testers couldn't do that anymore. And so it was natural to me. And I had not realized that it, like you say, in larger organizations, yeah, we're going to implement Agile, and they don't even talk to their operations people. So the teams might be even doing a pretty good job of Agile development, but they're still throwing code over the wall now to operations to deploy it and monitor it in production, take care of it. So DevOps, you know, Patrick Dubois came up with that term and had the first DevOps conference in, I believe, 2009, with the idea of we need to bring the operations people in. Because we got the developers, and... They didn't, they didn't just mean coders, they meant testers. They meant, you know, all the different sp designers, all the different specialists on a feature team. And now we're going to bring in the people who care more about the operations, which includes the security people, you know, the compliance people, all performance people, all the people on that side, we need to work together. And, and so I don't care what we call it. I remember years ago, probably 2001. I was I was fortunate to be talking to Kent Beck, who wrote the first book on extreme programming, extreme programming explained at a conference at a testing conference. And I'm like, why did you choose the name extreme programming? That's just the dumbest name and it's not going to appeal to people. And he said, well, he said, I hope in like 10 years, people just call it good software development. And I think that's where we should be at. We don't need a label for it. It's just how can we keep doing better? How can, how can we do our best work at delivering value to customers? But apparently human beings, we need labels for things. So call it what you will. But I think it's been helpful because it does, it does embrace that holistic approach. We're all in this together. The last place I worked um, uh, full-time, I thought they had the best DevOps culture I had seen up to that point other than in a really small company because it was a bigger company. So they had platform engineering teams who, you know, were doing the paved road, right? Building the infrastructure for all the feature teams to use. And they embedded as site reliability engineers, they called them dev, they called them dev advocates, which I thought was interesting. They embedded them onto the feature teams. So every feature team had one and conversely, they took developers in the feature teams and embedded them on the platform teams because what infrastructure is code. We got to do a good job of, of writing that infrastructure code. 
And, you know, they've rotated people around pretty frequently to spread those skills. And so I was able to build really good relationships with people on the platform team, managers on down and work side by side. I was like, oh, we're going to change our deployment tool. We're going to change from GitHub Actions to Harness for whatever reason. And, and oh, how do we do that without breaking something? How do we test it? And so I could work together with the developer and the SRE. Let's put a test strategy together. And I could talk to the experts on the platform team to say, what should we watch out for? What are the potential risks? And then we could design a test strategy and do the testing to mitigate those risks. And just like we would with a software feature. And so I got to experience the magic of, of a good DevOps culture as well. So, you know, I feel like that's what we should all be striving for. Yeah, for sure. You also talked about test strategy. Do you have some good resources for people of how they can maybe think about or build out a good test strategy? Well, I like to use visual models and I like to have everybody participate in the conversation. So the visual models are a good way to guide the conversation. And also we're all, we're all victims of our unconscious biases or cognitive biases, getting a diverse group of people together helps with that. And I, I think our brains, well, what I've learned about brain science, our brains work better when we talk to each other, when we move, we use our hands, you know, we've got to, we can't just talk in isolation and using a visual model and a virtual whiteboard helps us think outside the box. It helps us think laterally. So not just the logical vertical step-by-step -step thinking, but the lateral creative thinking. And so for example, for a test automation strategy, a lot of people make fun of the test automation pyramid now, but I still like it. And I find it drives very good conversations. Of course, it doesn't fit every context. But when we start talking about, oh, what are all the tests we need to do? Hmm, where, where should we automate those tests? Could they be automated at the unit level? Do they need to be auto? Do we need an end-to-end -end workflow test? It gets us talking about it, and we have a more complete conversation. We don't. We're not as likely to overlook things, uh, and you know, we're all putting sticky notes on the on the virtual whiteboard. So any kind of visual model, I think, is is super helpful. The agile testing quadrants that Janet and I learned from Brian Merrick years ago and, and adapted and have used in our books and our courses. Let's think about test quality from a business perspective. Let's think about quality from a technology perspective. What kind of tests would help us guide development? What kind of tests would help us evaluate our product and make sure we've built the right thing? Having a quadrants model helps us think about here's all the testing we're going to need to do and help us plan the testing. And it really generates good conversations. It's adaptable. It's not, it's not a prescribed bunch of rules. There's no rules for what goes in what quadrant. It's what works for your team. And it can even help you track, you know, where are we in, in doing these testing, this, this testing. So things like that are what I, what I encourage people to do, or even a mind map, or we've got story mapping, user story mapping from Jeff Patton. We've got, you know, testing is all part of that, right? Testing is not as, again, Elizabeth Henderson, testing is not a separate activity from development or from coding. Coding and testing are part of software development. So anything, any kind of development strategy we have, testing needs to really be part of that. And again, everybody, we need that diverse group. We need all those different skills, people in all the different specialties working together to come up with that. Who, who are the people in that conversation? Well, testers, coders, product people, designers, customer, I like the customer support involved because they're the usually the closest to customer pain points, architects, operations, specialists, SREs, platform engineers. I mean, all dependent on your context, obviously. I've mostly worked on web applications. And so, you know, that's where my experience and my, and my bias are is quite, quite a bit different for people working on embedded software are going to have really different challenges, for example. So they may have, you know, I, we advocate, uh, everybody should be doing the testing on one team with embedded systems, you might actually have a separate test team because maybe your development team doesn't have access to the real devices. You're testing on simulators. Somebody's got to test on the real devices. That might be somebody else who's closer to them. So obviously we want to collaborate, but we, we really have to 
get everybody involved, having the business stakeholders involved. I've had, I've had, I've had my product owner tell me, don't invite the business stakeholders to that meeting because they just bring up too many, <laughs> too many issues. It's like, but no, we want to know about, <laughs> we want to know about those things. So yeah, it's depending on your context. Okay. Uh, you know, people talk about, Janet and I talked on our first book about power of three. We want the product person, the developer, and the tester. I think nowadays our systems have just become more complex. There's more to them. We've got distributed architecture in the cloud, lots of different challenges. We're probably going to have more than three people in that conversation. Amazing. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for explaining that. I wanted to see if we could get some more clarity around it because not everyone is an expert like you in knowing all those things, you know, let me ask you this question. If you could like wave a magic wand and create your ideal environment and process for building and releasing software, what would that look like for you? First of all, I would do ensemble programming. Ensemble programming. Or mob programming. What is that? People know it as mob programming. Oh, well, it's taking pair programming. So pair programming, you've got two people working together. It might be two developers. It might be a developer and a tester. It could be anybody in any role. Ensemble, ensemble programming is taking that up, just turning up the volume on that. So now we have developers, testers, designers, product owner, maybe customers. Well, we've got, you can't really have more than about seven people because it gets too crazy. We're all in a virtual room or a real room. We're going to build a feature. It sounds really crazy. Like, why are we all working together? It seems very wasteful. So then we start working and and we take turns driving and navigating and everybody can, can bring up their ideas. And what's cool about it is if we have a question of, oh, I'm not sure you know, where, where should this particular icon be on the screen? Well, guess what? The designer's right there. So as Woody Zool said, he's Woody Zool's one of the leaders of, of, ensemble, of inventing mob programming. He's got a new book on it, out, I think. There's zero question queue time. You've got everybody in the room who can, you got, you can get all the questions answered right now. So you're not waiting to go find the product owner to ask a question. You're not waiting to go find an operations person maybe to ask a question. You're trying to have all the people you need in that room for the thing that you're doing right then. And here's what happens. You get it done faster and you get it done right. So there's no rework later. <laughs> you develop over exactly what the customer wanted. And it is actually more efficient and it's way more fun. Not, not everybody's comfortable working in that environment. And... And especially in person, it takes a certain infrastructure. And even remotely, you have to you have to sort out how are you, you know, as you switch drivers, how are you going to handle the source code repository and committing changes and all that kind of stuff. But that's my ideal way to do software development because uh, I've just seen that it works the best and I've been lucky to be on teams that do it. Mara, Pia Jarvi, and Lisey Hawk, there are other people who've, done a lot and written a lot about it. And especially because they're more in the testing perspective, I found it extremely valuable for testing, doing an ensemble testing session in 30 minutes. If you have a diverse group of people looking at a new feature, you are going to learn so much in such a short amount of time and probably find a lot of bugs. And so it's just a more efficient and happy way to work. Now that I have more free time, because I'm not working at a full-time job, I wanted to contribute to open source. And what I learned about open source projects was it's very solo. <laughs> it's all working off pull requests. So somebody in some part of the world gets a story from GitHub Actions or whatever, and codes it up and, and submits a pull request. And somebody else reviews it and, and merges it. But I don't have those coding skills. And so I was like, I was like on these different Slack channels or Slack workspaces for open source projects going, ah, I'd like to pair ensemble with somebody. And they're like, they don't even know what I'm talking about. So then I was lucky because I learned about the Cucumber open source new contributors ensemble. It's a weekly session that lowers the bar. I don't have to have, I don't even have to have an ID installed on my computer. I don't have to clone the repo. We have the technology to do the screen sharing so that we can all work together. I don't have to be a coding expert because when it's my turn to drive somebody, tell me what I should type. I can still contribute my ideas. I can still contribute my design ideas. I can still say, hmm, maybe we need to test for that because we're doing test-driven development 
or maybe we needed something higher level than a unit test for that. How are we gonna test that? You know, what's the most best thing for the customer? And I've seen how easily that gets people into contributing to open source because it's an ensemble, it's a group of people working together. So I just see value in it in so many ways. And, but you know, managers, the place I worked last, they brought in, div, well, we had a whole rotation of new CTOs and CEOs <laughs> over the course of a year. And eventually, they brought in a CTO who's like, what are you doing with this mobbing? Or we called it blobbing. And we had maybe three or four people where we were a pretty small team. So we would have three or four people in a blob. And they're like, well, you can't do that anymore. Don't spend more than 30% 30, 30 of your time. You could pair. That'd be okay. But you can't do these. You can't have more than two people. Why are they telling us how to develop software? We had been rocking delivering features. Everybody was very happy with our team because we were cranking out the features. They were high quality. We didn't have bugs in production. But somebody who doesn't understand it says, well, it, it can't be efficient. So it's all about the leadership. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've actually never heard of ensemble programming. And Lisa, it sounds amazing. Well, it's more, to... it's more well known as mob programming. Okay, but, yeah, I've seen you know, a few years ago when we had a lot of violence in the country, mob just didn't sound like such a good name. Mm -hmm. okay. So ensemble yeah. is a kinder, gentler name. And even Woody Zoll's new book, I think he still, I think he uses both terms in the name of the book. So, but like, I mean, I was just on, I had the good fortune last fall to be, be, part of a, the Mob Mentality Show, which is a, a podcast and video teaching people about it. We, there's a role-playing game you can do to learn about it from Willem, Willem Larson has a role-playing game uh, on GitHub. And so we recorded, we played the role-playing game and recorded it to show how you can learn how to do it from this really fun RPG. So um, there are a lot of fun ways to, to dip your toe into it. It sounds crazy. And then once you experience it, it's like, oh, I, I can totally see the benefits of it because, again, as you've talked about, I've done a lot of work in open source and, yeah, the typical pattern is you work alone, create a pull request, then you wait for someone to review. And that cycle is so long. Sometimes, especially on open source software where some things are kind of passion projects that you're working on with other people and there's no rush to get things done, it takes us months and months to figure out how to even implement the feature. And so I'm kind of, and then I've also had similar conversations when we're in person, we'll just sit down and start coding out a feature together and thinking like, what should it look like? And we get mm -hmm. so much more done in a faster mm -hmm. yeah. way. And that's very cool. You know what? One thing I, that comes to my mind with ensemble programming that I could imagine many people would have, and I even imagine myself starting out being a, fresh new tester with very little technical skills, I would feel very intimidated to either participate or even worse to drive the creation. How like, how do we overcome that? Or what do you think we should be doing if we're a new tester or engineer in that kind of role and now we gotta drive? There are good practices for running these sessions. And so one of the good practices is they're, they're basically rules. You know, everybody needs to feel safe. Everybody's an equal value. Yes, as a non-coder, I'm going to slow things down. But guess what? Slowing down can be good. Because you might think of something you didn't think of if you just raced ahead. So like with the Cucumber session, we read the rules each time. Just to We're trying to increase diversity. So we're trying to provide the safe space. People, we don't care what skills people have. Everybody's going to contribute something. And whatever we're doing, whether it's automating a test, writing some new code, doing exploratory testing together, we're going to have some benefits. But I, I get intimidated too. And I just feel so little when I'm driving. I just feel like, oh my God, I, you know, I forgot what the shortcut is in this IDE or, you know, and I feel bad. But when I've, you know, when I did, especially on my last job where I, where I was part of the ensembles, I would usually ask for you know, it's good to do a little retrospective at the end of the session. Say what went well, what didn't go well. And I would always ask the, the coders on my team, like, 
do you feel like I slowed you down? Did I ask? Because I'm always asking a bunch of questions. And they're like, no, if you wouldn't have asked that question, we would have sent this out with a bug in it. So you've prevented a bug by asking your question. So things might feel slower, but they're saving time maybe later on. Mm, that totally makes sense. But it's um, challenging. It's challenging. It takes yeah. some courage to, to try it. It's uh, Yeah, it's uh, very different, but I, I can see so many benefits in it. You mentioned two resources that I want to link to. Um, you mentioned Cucumber is doing this, and also mm -hmm. you did some game. Do you have mm -hmm. links to those that I can I do. I do. I drop? can send you those links. Yeah. Yeah, that's super cool that the Cu Cucumber community is doing that. Yeah. it's and, and what's really interesting is we really do get a diverse group of people. We get people from all over the world. We get people of all colors and all genders, and it is just really cool. Here's the RPG. It's like a community building experience while also making progress on features that's yeah exactly very cool and and of course if you're part of a team right that's like a team building event where mm -hmm. you're just establishing rapport with each other or or getting angry at each other <laughs> no i mean for me you know now that i'm freelance and working by myself a lot it's just nice to be with other humans <laughs> doing yeah. something together building i think you know, we mentioned earlier, building community can be really hard. I, I struggle with it. But if you're in a group of people that is trying to create something, that automatically helps build that community, I think. Because yeah. Because you have a purpose. So you have a goal. Yeah. A common goal. And you yeah, can see totally the outcomes of it. Yeah. It totally makes sense. All right, Lisa, I got two more questions for you. First... Where can people learn more about you? I'm certainly going to link to a bunch of the books that you've written, like a hundred plus. Where, where can people learn about you? Well, my website is lisachrisman.com. So there's a whole bunch of information there. And also there are links there to agiletester.ca, which is our book website. So you can learn, not only learn more about our books, but there are a lot of resources there, free resources you can download to help with agile testing and test automation and lots of things. And then also our Agile Testing Fellowship, which is our training company that I have with Janet Gregory and, and Jose Diaz. And we have training providers all over the world, which is super cool. So I don't know if we have every continent, not Antarctica, <laughs> but, but lots of parts of the world. And also it's the course, the first course we did has been translated into like Spanish, Portuguese, German. So, and then we have instructors who can, you know, not all the course materials are translated to every language, but we have instructors who teach it in whatever the native language is where they're teaching. And so you can go there to see more about the courses and training providers and stuff. So I think from there you will find everything about me. <laughs> and I'm on Twitter and Mastodon and LinkedIn. I'm trying to get better with LinkedIn. I've always felt challenged by that. Yeah, really. LinkedIn is LinkedIn <laughs> then needs to step up their social media game for sure. All right, one final question. What one tip can you give us to create world class testing? I have come in the last few years to feel like the most important thing to do is build relationships. So if you're starting a new job, if there's some new skill you want to learn, find friendly people. <laughs> Most people are friendly and say, hey, can I have 30 minutes with you and build those relationships? I think one thing that inspired me for that was Katrina Clokey's book, Practical Guide to Testing and DevOps, which is available on LeanPub. And she has a, she kind of starts a book out with a big section on how important it is to not only have good relationships with the people on your software development team, but also, you know, if other people are in a separate team, like maybe the operations people are somewhere else or platform team or designer, sometimes designers are separate. Get to know those people, find ways to get to know them, you know, ask for their help, ask them to say, hey, can you come, can, can I come and learn from you, you know, like from the operations person, can I learn what our deployment pipeline looks like? From the designer is it can i learn how you know when next time you start designing something can i watch when you have a meeting can i can i just watch your meeting and see what kind of discussions that you have and build those relationships because then when you have a need 
all of a sudden you have the people in your corner who can help you, who can answer your questions and give you advice and give you the resources where to learn something. So everything we do, we do better when we collaborate. And we have to we have to get to know people to collaborate with them. So learn and yeah, sometimes you have to learn their lingo. You have to learn the terminology. Like if you want to talk to SREs and platform engineers, well, you, you need some of the DevOps terminology and it might be something you don't know yet. So familiarize with yourself with that. There are a lot of Creature and Kulky book, book is great for that. There are a lot of DevOps for dummies. There's uh, Grok and Continuous Delivery, a lot of beginner books out there you can learn. That's just one example. I mean, whatever area it is you want to learn more about, get to know the basic terminology so you can communicate with those people. And hopefully they'll learn some, if you're a tester, hopefully they'll start learning some testing terminology and concepts to communicate better with you. <laughs> That's so beautiful, Lisa. That's a wonderful message because a lot of times I think the advice that I have seen to this question is technical or implementation focused. and I think you touched on such a great point in that almost none of us build software independently. It's always part of a team. And so, right, having healthy relationships around that will certainly contribute to better software, right? Yeah. Much better. Yeah. Cool. Well, and we'll have more and we'll have more joy in creating. Yeah, for sure. That's true. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you here and to learn everything about agile testing. Everybody, please follow Lisa Crispin on LinkedIn, Twitter, and beyond in her website. I'll definitely link to that below in the description and it'll pop up on the screen as well. Lisa, thanks so much. It's been such a pleasure and it's so nice to meet you virtually. Well, thank you. It's been an honor to be your guest and Look forward to watching your episodes as well. Sounds great. Yeah, we get, I'm excited for that too. Thank you so much for taking the, your valuable time today to join me on the Test Automation Experience. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the show so you get a weekly notification on all of the new interviews. If you want to follow me on social media, you'll find that here. And if you want to follow our community, you'll find all of that here. You'll find all the relevant links and show notes in the description below. And if you have any comments, please comment below or use the anonymous form to leave me feedback about the show. I will sincerely appreciate it so I can use it to improve. Thanks so much again. It's been a true pleasure. I've been Nikolai Advalotkin, and I'll see you next time.